66-year-old Sharon Erickson loved being retired. And as the former assistant treasurer of Saunders County stepped out of her house on this cool Thursday morning in June of 2003, she thought, not for the first time, that one of her only regrets in life was that she hadn't retired a few years sooner. Now, turning to look up and down the tiny business district of Colon, Nebraska, one of the smallest towns in America, Sharon ran through her mental list of what she planned to do that early summer day. After spending 37 years collecting tax revenue and keeping perfect records of complicated financial transactions, the routines that Sharon had put in place over the last five years of her non-working life had given her the time and opportunity to pursue her own interests and hobbies. And even though getting her hair styled every Thursday afternoon was not exactly a hobby, it was one of the weekly appointments that Sharon looked forward to the most. Putting her hand up to her brown hair, Sharon patted the big puffy curls that had been her signature style for as long as she could remember. And since the hair salon where Sharon went every week to have her hair done was out in Cedar Falls, that meant an enjoyable 10-minute car ride due north to a town that was more than four times bigger than Colon, which clocked in with just 128 residents. For Sharon, the drive to Cedar Bluffs was also a trip down memory lane. This was where Sharon had gone to high school, the same high school where Sharon's mother had spent years of her teaching career. In addition to seeing some familiar sights and maybe grabbing a quick bite to eat, Sharon's weekly appointment was always a nice opportunity to chat with her hairdresser about what was going on in Saunders County, where both towns were located, and to exchange local news, personal stories, and opinions about everything from the weather to state and county politics. And after an hour of friendly conversation, in which the women would feel like they had identified and probably solved most of the world's problems, Sharon could enjoy a stroll around the local farmer's market before she hopped back into her silver Taurus sedan and headed back home to 112 Spruce Street. Sharon knew that from the outside, this weekly visit to Cedar Bluffs, along with her other daily and weekly routines, might look unexciting and even boring, but to Sharon, who had been divorced for many years and who did not have any children, these routines represented all the ways in which she had become part of the social fabric of Colon, Nebraska, her home for the last 47 years. And it was this connection that had made Sharon's retirement meaningful. As the strongly built woman with bright blue eyes and big hair stepped into the post office right next to her home, she stopped long enough to say good morning to the postmaster, Rick Hartman, before walking over to her post office box to check for mail. Sharon was good friends with Rick. She had hired him to do various repairs and improvements to her house, and when Sharon was away on one of the trips she enjoyed taking with her cousin, who lived 40 minutes south in Lincoln, Sharon left her house key with Rick so he could keep his eye on the property while she was gone. The post office, always Sharon's first stop, was also a good place for Sharon to catch up with neighbors and local news. And even though Sharon had never been known as a person who meddled or pried into other people's business, all her years in customer service and all her years of handling bills and money had left Sharon with a keen eye for making sure that things in her own little hometown were running smoothly. Sharon had always been known at the Saunders County Treasurer's Office as a very honest and straightforward person who would not cheat her employer or taxpayers out of a single minute's worth of work. She was also known as someone who would not shy away from confronting someone if she thought they were doing something wrong or inappropriate. That was an attitude that Sharon had learned as the oldest of three children who'd been raised on a farm in Dodge, Nebraska, and who'd grown up taking care of land and livestock. In fact, here in Colon, there was a whole generation of 20-somethings who could remember Sharon calling them out when they were just children or teenagers if they got up to any trouble or mischief. And that no-nonsense attitude was also on display when it came to Sharon's prickly relationship with one of the long-distance truckers who sometimes parked his rig overnight on Colin's Main Street and left the engine running and the wheels of his truck partway on the sidewalk right in front of Sharon's home. As the postmaster, Rick, and everyone else in the tiny town knew, Sharon had an ongoing argument with the trucker, and, like everything else in Colon, disputes like that sparked plenty of satisfying gossip, and there was speculation that the trucker actually enjoyed riling up his strong-willed and outspoken critic. But, except for her disagreements with this trucker, Sharon Erickson was one of the most popular and best-known residents of Colon. 
Even Sharon and her ex-husband, Robert Lee Erickson, had parted on good terms, and when their marriage ended, Robert had left two commercial properties to his ex-wife. And after the divorce, Sharon had converted Erickson Market, a little grocery store, into her private home, and on the lot across the street, she now had a garage where she kept her car. But it was what Sharon had done with part of the former grocery market that had won her a special place in the heart of her community. When the bar slash cafe in Colon, where residents would all go to grab coffee and talk, closed down, Sharon had hired Rick, the postmaster, to remodel the front room of her home into a little community meeting place with tables and chairs and free coffee. And then Sharon handed out keys so Colon residents could come and go as they liked. And not only did Sharon offer free refreshments, she could also still help Colon residents out with questions or any problems related to their county tax bills. After chatting for a few minutes with Rick, Sharon waved goodbye to her friend and walked out of the post office to make her next stop at the local bank. Not only did Sharon keep her checking and savings account there, she and the bank employees had shared a common career in managing and keeping track of money, and so there was always common ground for discussion. Except, now that Sharon was retired, she mostly just liked to talk about what vacations she might like to take with her cousin. Along with her skill as a dancer, who never missed the chance to twirl the night away with her local singles group, Sharon also loved outdoor activities like fishing and visiting her sister out in Colorado. By the time Sharon had arrived home late that afternoon from her trip to Cedar Bluffs, she was looking forward to the phone call that was always the final scheduled event of her day. After pulling her car into the small tan garage that was located across the street from her house, Sharon walked outside and used the remote to close the garage door. Then she turned and crossed Spruce Street to her red brick home with the big glass windows that faced onto the street. Although Sharon was not someone who scared easily, as a single woman living alone, she was very mindful of her personal safety. While she had welcomed the community into one of the front rooms of her house, that room was closed off from the rest of Sharon's house, and Sharon had made sure that her window coverings blocked any view from the street into or out of Sharon's living space. About a year and a half ago, Sharon was sure that while inside her house, she had seen one of her doorknobs turn, as though someone outside was checking quietly to see if the door was unlocked. In response, Sharon had immediately installed door alarms that were designed to go off in the event of any forced entry. Behind Sharon's house, there were only a handful of other residential buildings separated by a narrow alley from Sharon's own property. And about a half block away, there was also a small field containing long, round, white steel tanks filled with anhydrous ammonia. Anhydrous ammonia was one of the ingredients used to make fertilizer, but it was also one of the key ingredients that went into the illegal production of methamphetamine, the highly addictive and popular stimulant that, in the last several years, had driven up the rate of crime and health problems throughout the population in the rural Midwest. Concerned about the alleyway and about people trying to steal anhydrous ammonia from those tanks, Sharon had enclosed her own backyard by putting up a six-foot-high chain-link fence, leaving just the back and side doors with access to her fenced-in backyard. Now, glancing at her watch, Sharon stepped up to her front door, turned the key, and let herself inside her cozy wood-paneled living room. Sharon was looking forward to changing into comfortable clothes, admiring her freshly styled hair, then settling into the soft brown armchair tucked into the corner next to a reading lamp. And then, at 5 p.m. sharp, Sharon would do what she did every day, chat on the telephone with her cousin in Lincoln. The two women, who enjoyed traveling together and who visited each other at least several times a week, had plans to get together that Sunday for lunch and a movie. After chatting for a few minutes, the two friends confirmed those plans and then ended the call. As for the rest of Sharon's day, it wouldn't be too long before Sharon made one quick circuit of her house and made sure all the doors were locked and she was buttoned up tight for the night. Not that Sharon expected any trouble. After all, if there was one person in Colon who knew all of her neighbors and practically everybody else in town, it was Sharon. To her, the little town of Colon was an open book and a book with its ever-changing stories and secrets that Sharon never tired of reading. And besides, when it came to personal safety, Sharon had one more line of defense. 
tucked inside the drawer of her nightstand, right next to Sharon's bed, was a small Beretta handgun. It wasn't until the evening of Monday, June 30th, 2003, that Sharon Erickson's cousin in Lincoln picked up the phone and dialed the number for the state bank in Colon, where Sharon did her banking. Sharon and her cousin had spent the previous day, Sunday, having lunch together and watching a movie. When Sharon had left Lincoln at 4.30 p.m. that Sunday afternoon, the two friends had said goodbye and promised to talk again the next day, Monday, at the usual time, 5 p.m. But it was now nearly 6 p.m. on Monday, and Sharon was not picking up her phone, despite her cousin calling her over and over again. And Sharon's cousin could just not keep the concern out of her voice when she asked if anyone at the bank could just walk two doors down the street to Sharon's house and just make sure Sharon was okay. In a town as small as Colon, where residents were used to looking out for one another, this was not an unusual request. But even though two bank employees immediately made arrangements to step away from their workstations to go check on Sharon, given how little crime there was in this tiny town, they were not really that worried. All that changed when the two women reached the front door of Sharon's house and saw an unread morning newspaper lying inside the screen door. Along with the folded newspaper was a delivery of frozen food with a sticker indicating it had been left there at about 1 p.m. and a note, sorry I missed you, that suggested Sharon had not answered the delivery person's knock on the door. Even as their own knocks went unanswered, the two women from the bank were suddenly aware of the sound of a door alarm going off in the side or the back of the house. A minute later, and the women had called Sharon's friend and Colin's postmaster, Rick Hartman. Together, the three of them entered the unlocked front door to Sharon's house, their sense of neighborly concern quickly turning to worry and dread. One look into Sharon's empty bedroom, and that worry turned to fear. Sharon's bed was unmade, and on top of her nightstand, Rick saw an empty gun holster. The only other place left to search for their missing neighbor was Sharon's garage across the street. Grabbing the extra remote from its hook near the front door, it was only moments before Sharon's friends were watching the garage door slowly roll upward to reveal Sharon's silver Taurus. And there, right next to the car, lay the blood-spattered body of its owner, 66-year-old Sharon Erickson. And next to her body lay a small black Beretta pistol. By 7 p.m. on the evening of that Monday, June 30th, a little over 24 hours after Sharon had arrived home from her Sunday afternoon visit with her cousin in Lincoln, the street outside Sharon's home and garage was filled with flashing lights as sheriff deputies and medical personnel responded to the 911 call that Rick had made about 15 minutes earlier at 6.42 p.m. And right from the very start of the investigation into what had happened inside that garage, the town's postmaster did not hold back when it came to offering law enforcement his personal theories and observations. Even before the yellow crime scene tape was strung up around the perimeter of both properties, Rick Hartman was explaining to police that Sharon must have used the handgun that was found on the floor of the garage to commit suicide. Repeatedly ducking back under the crime scene tape to join officers clustered around Sharon's body, the postmaster would back up his theory by pointing out the fact that Sharon's own father had ended his life with a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head back when Sharon was just 23 years old. But even a very quick examination of Sharon's body, laying face up on the floor and parallel to her car, was enough for investigators to rule out suicide because not only was the Beretta unloaded and showing no signs of having been recently fired, there was also a bloody footprint on the floor that did not belong to Sharon. And after visually inspecting the injuries to Sharon's body, it looked to police like whoever else had been in that garage hadn't shot Sharon. Instead, they had delivered a long and savage beating to one of Colin's best known residents. Meanwhile, deputies who had done a sweep of Sharon's house across from the garage reported back that the phone line to Sharon's house had been cut. It also appeared that an intruder had climbed over Sharon's six-foot-high fence and then used a chisel to break into Sharon's house through the side door, setting off the door alarms as well as the motion sensor alarms in the backyard. And even though Sharon's security system seemed to have worked, the actual alarms had not been loud enough for any of Sharon's neighbors to notice that Sharon's house had been broken into. 
even as the Saunders County Sheriff's Department put out the call for assistance in the case to the Nebraska State Patrol, investigators on the scene noticed one more chilling detail about the crime scene. The shirt Sharon was wearing had been pulled up and her underwear was exposed. It now appeared likely that the first homicide in Colon in more than 40 years might also include a sexual assault. Within hours of discovering Sharon's body, crime techs were busy collecting and processing physical evidence from the house and garage on Spruce Street, and police had already begun fanning out around the tiny town of Colon to see if anyone heard or saw anything suspicious that might be connected to the murder. But wherever state and local police went, it seemed like the terrified residents of Colon had already heard about the brutal attack, and the town was already swirling with rumors and speculation. Was the killer someone Sharon knew, or a random stranger passing through town? Was this a burglary gone wrong? Was the murder somehow connected to Sharon's past and to her work at the county treasurer's office? And at the center of all the speculation, residents were asking themselves, what was it about Sharon Erickson that they didn't know? By Tuesday, July 1st, the day after Sharon had been killed, there was already one name at the top of investigators' list of possible suspects. Colin's postmaster and volunteer firefighter, Rick Hartman. In the absence of a husband or romantic partner who might have had a personal motive for killing Sharon, Rick appeared to be an exceptionally close friend of Sharon's, someone Sharon had entrusted with a key to her house, and someone who had helped her with improvements to her property. Rick had also drawn suspicion to himself with his intense interest in what police were thinking and doing, and by repeatedly showing up near and even inside the marked-off crime scene areas. At the same time that police began to have conversations with Rick about his movements in the days leading up to Sharon's murder, investigators were also following up on another possible theory that Sharon's murder had been the result of a robbery gone wrong. Even though nothing of value seemed to be missing from Sharon's house, investigators were looking at the possibility that the break-in had awakened Sharon, who then confronted the robber with her unloaded pistol before fleeing from her house to the safety of her garage and the cell phone she kept inside her car. It was there that Sharon had been attacked and killed. But it wasn't long before both theories, Rick as murderer and robbery gone wrong, seemed to hit a dead end. Rick's wife and family confirmed his alibi for the likely time of Sharon's death. As for the robbery, the only person in town with a history of criminal offenses was a 24-year-old man who lived with his mother in a house across the alley behind Sharon's house. But like Rick, James Mars also had an alibi for the time of the murder. He'd been out drinking with friends in the neighboring town of Wahoo before arriving back home, checking in with his mother, who was asleep on the couch, watching TV, and then going to sleep in his bedroom. Like everyone else in Colon who police would interview over the next two weeks, James knew Sharon, but his only real contact with her had been when he was much younger and would sometimes pick up a few dollars, helping her with yard work or shoveling her snow. Meanwhile, the autopsy report on Sharon's body, which was released to police seven days after her murder, had confirmed police suspicions that Sharon had been sexually assaulted before she was killed. Unfortunately, the DNA samples that the medical examiner had collected from Sharon's body and clothing were not large enough to produce a DNA analysis definitive enough that police could use it to identify a possible killer. Police also came up short on other physical evidence. It appeared that the killer had not left any fingerprints or any trace of his own blood or tissue either inside Sharon's house or garage, or on the unfired gun that was found near Sharon's body. With James Mars and Rick Hartman on the back burner as suspects in this case, police turned their attention to two other possible leads. After hearing about the arguments that Sharon had had with the trucker who sometimes stopped over in Colon, investigators hopped into their service vehicles and drove throughout Saunders County, asking at gas stations and truck stops about a man with a red rig that had an eagle on its front license plate. At the same time, investigators were spending hours tracking down any possible link between Sharon's death and the drug trade. 
specifically whether Sharon might have been killed because she witnessed someone stealing anhydrous ammonia, the key ingredient in meth, from the tanks located half a block from her house. But almost three weeks after Sharon's murder, both of those leads had dried up too. That's when the trucker, unaware that there was an all-points bulletin out for him and his rig, passed through Colin again. But when he was stopped and questioned by investigators, the trucker presented gas and travel receipts that showed he'd been out of state at the time of Sharon's murder. By then, investigators had also failed to turn up any connection between Sharon's murder and the operators of any local meth labs. By late July, almost seven weeks after Sharon's murder, state and local investigators were no closer to finding Sharon's killer than they had been on the evening her body had been found sprawled out on the floor of her garage. And even as the residents of Colon were becoming more and more desperate for answers, the only thing detectives had left to do in a case that was quickly starting to go cold was to send the DNA evidence collected from Sharon's body and clothing to the crime lab at the Nebraska State University Medical Center for more advanced and sophisticated testing. Investigators also circled back to Colin's postmaster, Rick Hartman, raising the possibility that his alibi was not so solid after all. And as the cornfields surrounding Colon, Nebraska ripened over the course of that hot Midwestern summer, the rumor mill inside the little town had also heated up. And at the center of the gossip over Sharon's murder was speculation that Rick and Sharon had been having an affair that had somehow ended with Sharon's violent assault and death. And in October 2003, four months after Sharon's murder, investigators got a tip that put Rick right back in the number one position on detectives' list of suspects. At a recent garage sale of Sharon's furniture and other belongings, Rick had made what police viewed as a strange and suspicious purchase. Colin's postmaster showed up at the estate sale and bought Sharon's mattress. When Sharon's sister had confirmed that sale to investigators, their first thought was that maybe Rick wanted to get rid of the mattress because it contained traces of his own DNA that could link him to Sharon and to her murder. After again denying any involvement and explaining that he bought the mattress for use in his family's spare bedroom, Rick finally agreed to provide police with his fingerprints and hair samples. He also agreed to take a polygraph test but the results of that test were inconclusive. Still, with no hard evidence that linked Rick to the crime, investigators had to let Rick go and admit, at least for the time being, that their investigation into Sharon's murder had ground to a halt. It would be another six months after that interview and 10 months after the discovery of Sharon's body before investigators finally got the breakthrough in the Sharon Erickson homicide that they'd been hoping for. In April of 2004, detectives received a call from the Nebraska State Crime Lab. Using a single sperm cell they had found on Sharon's clothing, scientists at the state lab had been able to isolate a complete DNA profile of Sharon's presumed killer. And to the shock of everyone who had been involved in the investigation, that profile did not match the DNA submitted by the detective's number one suspect, Rick Hartman. Still, the new evidence breathed life and hope back into the Sharon Erickson homicide investigation, and soon detectives were once again poring over every one of the 200 interviews and 500 pages that made up the case file to see if there was anything they might have missed back in the summer of 2003. And within days, police had launched a DNA dragnet spreading out across Colon and other areas of Saunders County to collect DNA samples from people whose names they had found listed in previous interviews and sending each of those samples straight back to the Nebraska University Crime Lab. And just three weeks later, by the end of April 2004, 10 months to the day after Sharon's murder, investigators got another call from the crime lab. One of the DNA samples they had just tested was a perfect match to the killer who had left their DNA on Sharon's clothing. For the 128 residents of Colon, the name on that report would change everything they thought they knew about each other. And for years to come, Sharon's beloved hometown would become a place where people locked their doors, looked over their shoulders, and questioned the basic goodness of human nature. 
based on what investigators would discover from a review of Sharon's murder file coupled with that DNA evidence, here is a reconstruction of what police believe happened to Sharon Erickson in the early morning hours of June 30th, 2003. On the afternoon of Sunday, June 29th, while Sharon was spending the day with her cousin in Lincoln, Sharon's killer was also spending the day with their family. But unlike Sharon, whose golden years of retirement had capped a long and successful life of hard work and close friendships, on that particular day, the killer's feeling of everything going wrong in his life seemed to get worse with every passing hour. And by 1.45 a.m. on the morning of Monday, June 30th, the killer found himself standing outside the six-foot-high fence that encircled the backyard that belonged to Sharon Erickson, a single older woman who appeared to have at least one thing the killer really needed, and that was money. But over the last few hours, the killer had gone from feeling depressed about his life to feeling both angry and excited, like he was finally capable of taking steps that would change things for the better. Looking at the fence, the killer felt like he could easily climb over a barrier that was twice as high, and he didn't need a weapon to make his plan work. He'd already cut the telephone line, and all he needed now was the chisel inside his pocket that he could use to get inside that treasure box of a house. And just a minute or two later, the killer was dropping quietly onto the grass of the backyard and heading to the narrow space between the fence and the side door. And as he did this, the motion detector lights in the backyard switched on. And as soon as the killer had pried loose the door and then used his boot to kick the door open so he could slip inside, he began to hear the sound of the door alarm going off inside the house. The staccato bleat of that alarm was loud enough to wake Sharon from a sound sleep. Sitting up in bed, Sharon immediately understood that alarms were going off, and so she reached for the phone on top of her nightstand. Even before she had put the receiver to her ear, she had punched in 911. But instead of hearing the police operator at the other end of the telephone line, all Sharon heard was silence, no matter how many times she kept punching in those three emergency numbers. Dropping the phone and switching on her bedside lamp, Sharon jumped out of her bed, opened the drawer of the nightstand, and pulled out the holster where she kept her pistol. Even though the gun was not loaded, the Beretta felt solid and heavy in Sharon's hand. Dropping the holster onto the tumbled sheets, Sharon wrapped both of her hands around the grip of the gun, and when the intruder stepped inside her bedroom a moment later, Sharon was there waiting, gun pointed straight at his chest. But as soon as Sharon saw the face of her intruder, her eyes widened and the gun dropped a few inches as a burst of anger ran through Sharon's body. Yelling at the man in front of her to get out of her house, to leave and never come back, Sharon stepped forward to close the distance between them. Faced with Sharon's fury and looking down the barrel of a Beretta pistol, the intruder backed up, tried to get his bearings, and tried to remember that feeling of power that had surged through him when he had swung his body over Sharon's fence and kicked her door in just a few minutes ago. But the last thing he had expected when he entered Sharon's house was this show of anger and defiance, and this voice that put into words all of his failings and mistakes. Pivoting suddenly, the killer made for the door. It turned out there was nothing worth stealing in this house anyway, and now he just had to get away. But even as the killer slipped outside and headed for the empty street, he could hear Sharon's footsteps behind him. Dropping back into the shadows, the killer watched as Sharon, dressed, carrying her purse, wearing her slippers, gun in hand, came running out the front door and headed for her tan garage 50 yards away, already clicking the remote that opened the garage door. And suddenly, the killer understood what Sharon was about to do. She must have a cell phone inside her car, and she was going to call the police, tell them who he was and what had just happened. Sprinting out from the shadows, the killer raced after Sharon and made it into the garage right behind her even as the garage door was starting to roll back down. According to the autopsy that would be conducted on Sharon's body 36 hours later, the medical examiner would determine that the actual cause of Sharon's death was strangulation. But that came after a beating that would leave Sharon with severe blunt force trauma to the left side of her head, nose, and her left eye. Defensive wounds all along the left side of her body, along with cuts and bruising to her face, arms, and legs, all indicated that Sharon had struggled against her attacker with all of her strength. 
but all of Sharon's strength and all of her will to live would not be enough to save her. Before the attack in that garage was over, Sharon's killer, a man Sharon had known since he was a small child, sexually assaulted the 66-year-old retiree who had spent most of her life helping other people. Finally, Sharon's killer unwrapped his hands from around Sharon's throat. But when he looked down at his victim, Sharon's killer was shocked to find that Sharon was still alive. Exhausted, 24-year-old James Mars, who had been one of the teenagers Sharon had once scolded for getting into mischief, climbed to his feet. Stepping onto Sharon's chest and neck, he could feel her ribs and the bones in her neck start to break under the weight of his boots. He literally stamped the life out of his victim. It would turn out the alibi James Mars had given investigators back in July of 2003, about 11 days after Sharon was discovered, was riddled with lies. After spending the afternoon of Sunday, June 29th, just across the state border in Kansas, helping his aunt put a new roof on her house, James headed back into Nebraska to drink beer at one of his friend's houses. But by 12.30 a.m. on Monday morning, June 30th, James and at least one friend had gone to a local bar where they continued to drink for another half hour or so until they moved to a second bar called the Oasis. But they arrived at the Oasis right as the bar had stopped serving alcohol. And after the bartender refused to serve James another drink, James decided to experiment with a new kind of stimulant. And for the first time in his life, James tried cocaine. Too drunk and high to drive back to Colon using the main roads where he might be stopped by police, James left the bar nearly an hour earlier than he had told police, arriving back at his mother's house not at 2.30 a.m., but at 1.30 a.m. After digging into James's alibi, police would discover that one of James's friends had agreed to lie about when James left the bar, and James's mother may only have been guessing at what time James had actually arrived home. But one thing is certain, James did not just go straight to bed after watching a few minutes of TV in his mother's living room. Instead, by 1.45 a.m., riding a cocaine and alcohol high, James had decided that he could at least solve one problem in his life, the fact that he was flat broke, by robbing his neighbor who lived just across the alley that separated their two houses. James figured that Sharon, older and single, would be an easy target, Instead, as soon as Sharon had recognized who her intruder was, she confronted him in the same way she had when he was a teenager, asking what he thought he was doing and telling him to get out of her house. But after doing exactly as he was told, James saw Sharon make a run to her garage, and the thought of her calling police and getting him arrested, along with everything else that was wrong in his life, like the fight he'd just had earlier that night with his longtime girlfriend, his young daughter who didn't live with him, the string of part-time farm work rather than any steady job, all caused James Mars to snap. As he said to investigators when he later confessed to Sharon's murder, quote, I blew my cork. End quote. It wasn't until April 16, 2004, 10 months after Sharon's murder and six months after James had moved out of Colon to Lincoln, Nebraska, that detectives located James, re-interviewed him, and requested a DNA swab, which he agreed to give them. 13 days later, on April 29th, James's DNA came back as a complete match to the sperm cell that was found on Sharon's clothing. Five days later, on May 4, 2004, James Mars was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Three months later, in August of 2005, James Mars avoided a jury trial by pleading guilty to a lesser charge of second-degree murder that he believed would come with a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison. Instead, in January of 2006, three years and six months after killing his next-door neighbor, James was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Explaining the severity of the sentence, the judge told James, quote, Nothing I can say or do to you today can repair what your actions have done. You've taken a loved one, terrorized your community, and placed residents under a cloud of fear and suspicion. End quote. On July 18, 2019, 28-year-old Andrew Harper scrawled a little note inside of a card, and then he folded the card up, he slipped it into its envelope, and he handed that envelope off to a nearby friend. 
And this friend, after getting this envelope and Andrew's directions for what to do with it, he left Andrew's room and began walking down the hall all the way towards the other side of the Ardington house. The Ardington house, where they were staying, is this beautiful mansion built in the 1700s that sits on about 30 acres of gardens and parklands, and it's located about an hour west of London in the English countryside. Once Andrew's friend, with this letter in hand, had walked all the way across the mansion and had found the room he was looking for, he gently knocked on the door and then after being let inside, he made his way right over to 28-year-old Lissy Beckett and he handed her the envelope. Lissy and Andrew had grown up in the same town of Wallingford, which is a small rural town about 10 miles away from where they were, the Ardington House. And from the time Lissy and Andrew had met each other when they were 15 years old, they had become totally inseparable. It was truly love at first sight. And now, 13 years later, they were finally getting married. And so Lissy, after getting this envelope, she saw the writing on the outside of it and knew it was from her fiance. And so she smiled, she opens up this letter and she reads what's inside. And it just said, life is slippery. Here, take my hand. While on the surface, this little note seemed like nothing more than a romantic gesture from Andrew, in reality, those seven words contained in that card were a great representation of who Andrew really was. He was a protector. Ever since Lissy could remember, Andrew had always been so concerned with her safety. And for that matter, anybody around Andrew, Andrew was just worried about and wanted to make sure everybody was taken care of. And as Andrew got older and grew to be this massive six foot five inch tall man, his natural inclination to protect other people only became more pronounced. While Andrew was known for being incredibly charming and friendly and approachable, at a moment's notice, he could flip the switch and literally step in and use his big frame to protect anybody that needed protecting, no questions asked. And so it came as no shock to Lissy or really anybody who knew Andrew when Andrew, at the age of 19, became a special constable or volunteer police officer for the Timms Valley Police Department. This police department was the same one that oversaw Wallingford, where he and Lissy had grown up, and also the surrounding areas. And just a year after becoming a special constable, Andrew had done such an amazing job that he was hired on by the Timms Valley Police Department to be a regular constable, so a full-fledged police officer. And over the following years that he was a regular constable, Andrew's hard work and dedication would quickly make him one of the most well-respected and well-liked police officers on the force. In fact, just a few weeks before he sent off that letter to Lissy on the day of their wedding, Andrew had been promoted. He had been assigned to the road policing unit within the Timms Valley Police Department, and what that meant was, in addition to a host of new responsibilities on a day-to-day -day basis, Andrew would now become one of the police officers who would immediately respond to any emergency call that came in. He was basically a front-lines police officer now. And so, of course, this meant Andrew's job just became a lot more dangerous. But for Andrew, that didn't matter at all, because to him, the most important thing was protecting people in need. And so this promotion just gave him a bigger opportunity to do that. And so Lissy, after reading this little note that Andrew had just sent her, she set it down on the table, and now with a big grin on her face, she finished getting ready, and then that afternoon, she and Andrew would walk down the aisle, and they would say, I do, in front of their families and their closest friends, and then that evening, after the newlyweds had had their first dance as a married couple, they would tell each other that this was the happiest day of their lives. 28 days later, on August 15th, Andrew, along with his partner, who also was named Andrew, his name was Andrew Shaw, they were conducting a surveillance operation in a town called Reading. Reading is a town about 30 minutes south of Wallingford. Just after 11 p.m., the men finally decided it was time to shut down their operation and head back home. Their shift had actually ended four hours earlier, but being hardworking and diligent police officers, they had worked overtime because they knew it would help their unit. But now at 11 p.m. they were totally exhausted and so as they're kind of yawning and packing up their things, Shaw, who was driving, would fire up the engine of the unmarked BMW car they were in and then once it was on he would pull away from the curb and they would start heading north. 
At the same time, a very distressed man who lived not far from where Andrew and Shaw had just been doing surveillance, he called 999 and he told the dispatcher that just a few moments ago, this gray sedan had pulled up his driveway and stopped right outside of his property. Now, this man's property was off of a road called Admore Lane, which was this winding one-lane country road that had very little traffic and there was not that many properties off of it. And so for anybody to pull on to this man's property would have caught his attention, let alone a car pulling onto his property in the middle of the night. And so as soon as the man had seen these headlights coming up his driveway, he had gone to the window and watched, wondering, you know, what is this person doing? Had they turned onto the wrong property? You know, are they gonna turn around and leave? But to his horror, once this car had stopped right outside of his house, three masked men who were carrying weapons of some kind got out of the vehicle. And so at that point, the man had frantically dialed 999. And as he's trying to describe the situation to the dispatcher, he suddenly tells the dispatcher as he's looking out the window that he thinks these men are here to steal his quad bike. His quad bike was parked right outside of his detached garage and he saw them walking towards it. And so he tells the dispatcher, who's already told him that police are on the way, he tells the dispatcher, I can't wait any longer. I'm going out to confront them and stop them from stealing my bike. The dispatcher yells at him not to and says they have weapons, stay in your house, but this guy's not listening. And so he runs to his front door, he opens the front door up, but by the time he's looking outside, the gray car, the three masked men, they're all gone, and so too is his quad bike. And so he goes back in the house, he's talking to the dispatcher, and the dispatcher says, look, just stay at your house, the police are on the way, they will intercept that car, they'll get your quad bike back. And so seconds later, a call went out over the radio to Tim's Valley Police to go and intercept this gray car on Admore Lane. So whoever was closest, go over there. But be advised, the occupants of this car are three masked men that are armed and dangerous. Now, Andrew and Shaw, when they heard this call, they would have known that they were not the only officers that could have taken this call. And they also would have known that they've been off the clock now for like four and a half hours. There was no expectation that they would continue to work and go take this call. But they didn't care at all. When that call came across, the only thing they thought about was do your job. And so Shaw, he whips the car around and he speeds towards Admore Lane and he pulls off of the main road called the A4. He gets onto Admore Lane and he starts driving north. Now, as soon as they turned onto that road, their vehicle effectively blocked the way for anybody coming the other direction. And so at this point, they're expecting this gray car full of these masked men to be coming in their direction and they are now blocking the way. And so Andrew and Shaw, as soon as they get on that road, they know a close quarters confrontation is almost guaranteed. But when you listen to the dash cam footage from the front of their vehicle that picked up the voices of Andrew and Shaw as they turn onto this road, there is no nerves, there's no fear, there's no hesitation. They are calm as can be. This is what they have trained for. They were ready. And so Shaw, he's making his way up this winding road. It's totally pitch black. The trees are practically on top of the road. It's like a tunnel of trees. And so they're driving along this road. And then all of a sudden, up in the distance, you can see on the dash cam footage, you see headlights bombing toward them. They're way off in the distance. And then all of a sudden, that car, these headlights, they come flooring out right in front of them. And both cars come to a screeching stop. You can hear the screeching of the brakes on the dash cam footage. And so this car in front of them comes to a full stop and Shaw, he stops, but then he moves up just a little bit closer before fully stopping the car. And so now the two cars are only maybe 10 or 15 feet apart. At this point, it's important to understand that the vehicle that Shaw and Andrew were in was an unmarked car and they had intentionally not put on their blue lights as they're cruising up this road because they didn't want the suspects to see the blue lights in the distance and turn around and get away. And so now they've come face to face. And so Andrew and Shaw, they're looking at this vehicle and they can see that one, it's a gray sedan. So it matches the description of the car they're looking for. And two, behind this gray sedan is what looks like a quad bike that they are towing. And so they know this is the car they were looking for. It's on Admore Lane. This is going to be it. And so Shaw, he flips on the blue lights and Andrew, who's in the passenger seat, he opens the door and begins yelling at the occupants to stay where they are, but they don't listen. 
because now the masked men in the gray car, they know they've been caught. There's police right in front of them. And so suddenly one of the masked men in the back seat of this car, he leaps out of the vehicle and he runs around to the back of the gray car and he unhooks the quad bike. And then the gray car, without even waiting for this third masked man to get back inside, it just begins driving forward on the left side of Shaw and Andrew, basically trying to drive around them, despite the fact there's nowhere to drive. It's a ditch on either side of the road. But obviously these guys are desperate and willing to do anything to get away. And so this gray car has driven down into this ditch before Andrew and Shaw could do anything. And then the third masked man who's realizing he's being left behind, he starts running around the right side of the police car. So he's trying to go around the other way. And amazingly, as soon as the third masked man made it around to the back of the police car, the gray car somehow managed to pop out of the ditch and got back onto the road and it starts driving away from Shaw and Andrew. And as they're driving away, the third masked man is just on the road running after them. And so Andrew, seeing an opportunity to potentially grab this third masked man that was out on foot, he jumps out of the police car, he turns and starts running down the road after the suspects. And so Shaw, he doesn't have enough space on this road to turn around and drive after them. And so all he could do was put the car into reverse and then look over his shoulder and start driving in reverse after them. And so as Shaw is driving backwards down this road, he can see out of his rear window, Andrew, who is chasing the third masked man, who is chasing the gray car. And so we can see all this happening out his back window. And then something totally strange that just defied logic happened. The third masked man suddenly leaps as if he's trying to jump into the moving car. And at the same time, Andrew, who's closed the distance on him, kind of lunges for the third masked man. And then just as suddenly as these two maneuvers have happened, both men just vanish. And then the gray car just drives away and disappears. And so Shaw, he's watching this happening and he has no idea what he's just witnessed. He's thinking, where did Andrew go? Where'd the third masked man go? What's happened? but he still can only drive in reverse. And so he's just driving and driving. And then finally he reaches a point in the road that's just wide enough that he's able to turn the car around. And as he's doing that, you hear over dispatch that someone is asking Shaw, what's going on? Where are you? And all Shaw is able to say is my partner, Andrew has gotten out of the vehicle and I lost him. I don't know where he is. And so after Shaw has turned the vehicle around, he begins driving now facing the proper direction. And as he's driving down this creepy dark road, you don't see anything. It's eerily quiet. Andrew's nowhere to be found. The car is nowhere to be found. The third masked man, there's no one. And so Shaw is just driving down the road, hoping that as he makes one turn or the next, he's going to see his partner just kind of running on the road somewhere, but he doesn't. But as he's driving along, what Shaw didn't realize was that there were things in the road that belonged to Andrew. They were kind of small, so he didn't see them, but the footage would later reveal that it was almost like there was this trail of Andrew's things kind of littered all over the road. There was his wallet, then there was his badge, then there was his license and other ID cards, and then there was his glove, and then there was this piece of plastic that looked like it belonged on Andrew's vest. And then a little farther down the road, because Shaw is still driving and scanning for his partner and scanning for anything, and there's just nothing. As he's driving along, he would, in real time, notice something of Andrew's. And it was Andrew's stab vest that he wore over his chest. And so he stops the vehicle and he gets out. And again, he's on this totally pitch black road where it's weirdly quiet. And he's walking up and he grabs the vest. He comes back into his vehicle and he puts it down inside of his car. And at this point, over the radio, people are asking Shaw, you know, what's going on? Where are you? And you hear in Shaw's voice a bit of panic as he's like, I've found Andrew's stab vest. It was on the side of the road and he can't make sense of that he has no idea why it's there and dispatch they don't know what to make of that and so shaw just continued driving down this road thinking to himself what's happening here Meanwhile, less than a mile away at the end of Admore Lane, where it joined up with A4, which is where Andrew and Shaw had originally come in, two other Tim's Valley police cars had arrived at that intersection. They had gone there specifically to try to intercept this gray car as they fled. 
And so they're sitting at this intersection and they're looking up Admore Lane and they see headlights bombing towards them. It's the gray car and the gray car comes speeding out onto A4. It makes a hard turn and it speeds away from these two police cars. And so one of these two police cars that were waiting out on the A4, one of them takes off following the gray car. But the other police car, they stay right there because unbelievably, they had just spotted Andrew. It would turn out when Shaw first put the BMW into reverse and he began going in reverse towards his partner who was chasing the third masked man who was chasing the gray car, when he was doing that and he was watching out his back window and he saw the third masked man jump and then disappear and then Andrew disappeared, that was not a figment of his imagination. That really happened. The third masked man had attempted to jump into the moving vehicle and he had been successful. As for Andrew, why he suddenly vanished, the reason for that is truly horrific. The three masked men were 18-year-old Henry Long and 17-year-olds Albert Bowers and Jesse Cole. All three of them, prior to this night, had fairly extensive criminal records, and they proudly referred to themselves as career thieves, which basically just meant they spent all day and all night stealing from people. And so that night, they had gone out with the intention of stealing that man's quad bike. It's unclear how they knew he had a quad bike, but they definitely showed up prepared because they knew they would have to get onto his property and very quickly tow that bike out of there before the homeowner could stop them. And so they had attached this long, very thick rope to the back of their gray car. It was basically like this big loop of rope, almost like a lasso. And so when they pulled up onto that man's property, they backed up to the quad bike and they looped that stretch of rope over the handlebars of this quad bike. And then all three of them piled back into the gray car and they sped off with the quad bike in tow. But when they were on Admore Lane and came face to face with Andrew and Shaw and realized those are police officers and were caught, the third masked man, aka Jesse Cole, he hopped out of the gray car, he ran around to the back, and he unhooked the loop of rope from this quad bike, ditching the quad bike by the side of the road so that it would be easier for the gray car to make their getaway. And so once it was free, the gray car kind of took off without Jesse. And so Jesse ran around the cop car, but Jesse would get back up to the side of the gray car and he would leap into the window. Then as soon as he was inside and Henry, who was driving, he knew he was inside, so they're all good. Henry hit the gas and who was standing with both feet inside of that loop of rope dangling off the back of the gray car when the gray car suddenly accelerated? Andrew Harper. Andrew was swept off of his feet as the rope grabbed onto his legs, and so his head came back and smashed into the ground, and then he was dragged for 91 seconds at an average speed of 42 and a half miles per hour down Admore Lane. It was only after he had been dragged for over a mile, whipping violently side to side, smashing not only into the ground, but into trees and fence posts and shrubs, just getting destroyed on this road, that finally, when they pulled off of Admore Lane and got onto A4, that turn swung Andrew around and he smashed into a curb that dislodged him from the rope and sent him careening into traffic. At that point, one of those two police cars took off after the gray car in pursuit. But the other car, they saw Andrew as he was thrown off the back of the gray car and launched onto A4. Now, initially, they actually thought that the suspects were just hauling a dead deer behind them because it looked like a bloody deer carcass was dangling behind the car. But when they ran up to see what it was, they saw it was their colleague. It was Andrew. And so immediately they tried to save his life. But Andrew's injuries were catastrophic. He had been destroyed. And so Andrew Harper would die at 11.45 p.m. on the side of the A4, about 20 minutes after he and his partner had so selflessly agreed to go after this car despite the fact they didn't have to. The three killers were arrested about one hour after Andrew had died. A police helicopter had spotted their car parked amongst some buildings about four miles away from where Andrew was found. 
During their trial, the three teens would say they had no idea that Andrew was attached to that tow rope as they sped down Admore Lane. This is despite the fact that the prosecution, they went out and recreated the exact scene that played out on Admore Lane. They used the same car, they used the same tow rope, and they used a very lifelike dummy that was the same size as Andrew Harper. It was six foot five, 200 pounds, and they strapped it on the back of the car, and they drove the same mile stretch to see what it would be like to drive with Andrew attached to the back. And these experts that went through this recreation over and over and over again, they said the same thing. It was nearly impossible to drive the car because as soon as the dummy would start to shift one way or the other, it would tug and pull on this little gray car. And so handling this car would have been a nightmare, not to mention the fact that the sound of Andrew grinding against the cement and smashing into trees and posts would have been extremely loud. And so the prosecution attested that there was absolutely no way that those three teens wouldn't have known that there was a person connected to the back of their car. Also, the prosecution said that all along Admore Lane, they found blood on both sides of the road, high up into bushes and on trees, indicating that as Henry had driven along with Andrew behind him, he must have been swerving violently side to side, most likely, at least according to the prosecution, to try to dislodge the person that was stuck on the back of his car. But the three teens never changed their story. They also never once said they regretted what they did. They showed absolutely no remorse. And when the verdict was read and these three teens were not found guilty of murder, they were found guilty of manslaughter, but everybody knew that was significantly better because the sentences were so much shorter. When that verdict came back, these three teens were punching the air and cheering and laughing, just making a complete spectacle out of it. And then after being led out of the courthouse with the devastated family of Andrew Harper basically watching them, they were smirking and smiling at the cameras and waving and just treating the whole thing like it was one big joke. Still to this day, none of them have apologized or expressed any regret or remorse about what happened. In fact, two of the killers, Jesse and Albert, they've come out publicly and said they're going to write a book about this crime, about killing Andrew Harper, and there's no indication that this book is being written because they feel bad. It's almost certainly being written because it's an opportunity to make money. Following the verdict, Andrew's wife, Lissy, who was totally devastated, not only by the loss of her husband, but also by what she viewed as total injustice with regards to the fact that these three killers had not been convicted of murder, she would go on to lobby for years to pass a brand new law called Harper's Law that would give an automatic life sentence to any criminal that killed an emergency worker while they were committing a crime meaning this law would not differentiate between whether it was manslaughter or murder. If you killed an emergency worker while committing a crime, you're going to jail for life. And this year, Harper's Law was passed. However, it will have no effect on the sentences of Andrew Harper's killers. Henry would be sentenced to 16 years in prison, and the other two, Albert and Jesse, would be sentenced to 13 years in prison each. All three of them will be eligible for parole by the time they are 28 years old, which is the same age that Andrew was when they killed him. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Fallen podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please ask the Amazon Music Follow button if you can borrow some of their best Tupperware. 
When they say yes, immediately stain them orange with spaghetti sauce. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories we have posted on our main YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. We have a registered 501c3 charitable organization called the Mr. Ballin Foundation that honors and supports victims of violent crime, as well as the victims' families. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. Go to mrballin.foundation and click Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Lastly, we have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. So, that's going to do it. I really